In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I want to talk to you about being in the new, uh, living in the new. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit before we get into the, the actual text today. Um, a man was celebrating his 100th birthday and was approached by a news reporter who had remarked, I suppose that you've seen a lot of changes in your life. Yes, said the centurion. They said, I have, um, I have seen a lot of changes in my life and I've been against every one of them. And uh, so sometimes we're against change, but there is a great change that takes place in our life when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our heart and when we are saved, we're born again and the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. I thought about some new things, some things that's fun while they're new. Uh, sometimes we get a new book and we're very interested in that or sometimes uh, for those of us who like technology we find some technological things that really enthuse us for a little bit of time. Uh, uh, a new pair of shoes, the only bad thing about that is trying to break them in. Uh, maybe a new car or some new furniture, but there's nothing compar that compares with being a new creation and that is exactly what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Around AD 56, the Apostle Paul corresponded with the Corinthian believers. And the first epistle that we have recorded was quite a bit more harsh than the second. But in this epistle, Paul is appreciative of the success of the other instruction. He desired to strengthen and encourage believers to refute opposition. And in today's text, what we're going to see is the work of Christ in the areas of justification and sanctification and uh, reconciliation and I will break those down a little bit better for you in the message so uh, the, the sermon for today is going to focus on the fact that through Jesus Christ we're a new creature we have a new closeness and a new calling that we receive so if you would uh, turn in your copy of God's Word to 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 and I will invite you to stand to honor and reverence the reading of God's holy and, and inspired word. Second Corinthians chapter five, and I want you to look in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, and as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father, in Jesus' name, we again thank you for the ability to read your word and to have your word, Father, in our hands and to be able to understand it through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. So I pray today that your Holy Spirit would empower me to uh, bring forth this message. Father, that it would not be anything uh, about Josh, that it would be, Father, about you. And it would be about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray for your anointing in this time. And I do pray that you would forgive me of any way that I failed you, that I may be a fit vessel for your honor and your glory. When the time of invitation hits, Father, I pray that people will respond because they've heard the call of your Holy Spirit. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, when we talk about that phrase, in Christ, it talks about being in his spirit, in his character, in his uh, in his principles and in his ideas. I am of the opinion and I believe it to be true that Jesus Christ has our best intention at heart. I believe that he leads us and he guides us down the path which is right for us. I believe that when it's all said and done, he knows what's best for us. I believe that sometimes our heart will lead us down the wrong path, but I believe Jesus knows what's right for us. When it talks about being new, this is uh, about uh, in terms of quality. Uh, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has made me a new creature and I don't believe that I would be what I am without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that, that you believe the same way. Uh, for without Jesus Christ, I, I would be nothing. And I know that. So the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is being a new creature. Keep your Bibles open. I want you to see this for yourself. It's a good passage. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. One of the really great draws about Christianity is the fact that we can become something brand new. That we don't have to live in the old anymore. That we can be a new creature. In other words, the things that I don't like about myself, the things that I don't care for in that, the things that displease God about me, can be changed through the power of Jesus Christ. And I can be raised into being a new creature. Listen at what uh, uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 3 says. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. There's a death that takes place there and it's in Jesus Christ. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. And I'm telling you this, those of you who are in bondage today, those of you who have given your life to Christ, but you're just still struggling, remember this, there can be a new creature through Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm saved and I've given my life, I've been born again, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but I still struggle. Join the club. Is anybody here willing to admit that they don't struggle anymore? I think we sin every day. We talked about it a little bit, I, I believe, in the Wednesday Bible study. I believe we sin every day because we have this flesh that gets in the way. But I know this. I know what I've come from 10 years ago. And I know what God has brought me from. And I also believe that he's going to bring me to even greater places. And to do greater things. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I got to thinking about it. Creation is always initiated by God. Creation is always uh, initiated by God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's the same of the new creature that's inside of us that God initiates that. Can you go back to a time in your life where you were, maybe you were sitting in a pew or maybe somebody was talking to you in your home or, 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 or maybe you just came in the pastor's office. Can you go back to a time where there was a conviction that fell upon your life and you realized that you were living uh, in sin, that you had sin in your life? And you realized that you needed something that was greater than you, something that was bigger than you to get you out of your state, to get you out of your situation. I cannot save myself. And I know that. And if I'm going to be something other than the Josh that I don't like, I have to place my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to keep my eyes upon him or else I will go back to being something I don't want to be. And some of you are bumping your husbands or you're bumping your wives and you're saying, you need to be a new creature. Well, get them to Jesus. That's what you need to do. Get them to Jesus. If there is a hope for this world right now, I'm going to be honest with you. I know there's a lot of politics going on. It's not going to be found in one of the, one of the parties, the Republicans or the Democrats. It's not going to be found in them. If there is going to be a hope for this world, if there's going to be a hope for this nation, it is going to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that's going to make the change. Thank you for that. You're welcome to applaud. <laughs> the real change has to come from God. Remember this too, that you did not just wake up. I want to teach you some doctrine right here because I believe it's important. You did not just wake up one day and say, I think I want to get to God today. He initiated that love toward us and that scripture. Listen to what 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 says, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The appeasement, that, that word propitiation, the appeasement for our sins. A holy God has a holy standard. And we cannot appease him because we are sinful. And what Jesus Christ is, has done is he's lived in perfection. He has lived in perfection all of his life. 
He is perfection. And what He has done is lived perfection because we could not do it. And we're going to find out. He puts that righteousness into our bank account. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Through being a new creature, we find out that we have a new mind. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with the old deeds. And I'll tell you this. Don't, don't be caught up in the old again. Don't live in bondage. <coughs> Sometimes we as Christians are our own worst enemies, aren't we? Um, what was the old, the old adage? Uh, uh, the devil made me do it. I think sometimes we get in enough trouble on our own. But don't go back to that. Don't go back to bondage. Have a new mind. Also have a new heart. The heart we consider the seat of the emotions. We say, I love you with all of my heart. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, and, uh, and that ye have put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness. I want us to be a church that our hearts desire and our hearts beat to please God. Because I believe this, if we make Jesus the main thing about Belmont Baptist Church, and if we keep him on the throne and we worship him, I believe that he's going to take us to great places. I believe he's going to do something awesome through us. I feel it, I sense it, I believe it with all of my heart. I need you to believe it. But I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do something great. But we've got to keep Him on the throne. This is not about us. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have with that a new Lord. We allow Jesus to be on the throne of our lives. I want, I want you to listen to this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to teach you about a word. <laughs> It says this in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. I, that's the word I want to teach you. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. And, all, and, and he that died for all, that they should not live henceforth, live unto themselves, uh, but unto him which died and rose again. Now the love of God constraineth us. That's a big word, but I want to teach it to you because it's important. That word constraineth means to arrest or to hold. Now, uh, Jason is, is in law enforcement, you know that. And uh, if he has to make an arrest, uh, he puts the handcuffs. Where are you at, Jason? There he is. He puts the handcuffs on, on somebody, and I believe it's behind their back. And they are held there. They, cannot, uh, they can't really do anything but walk around a little bit. And even if you try to run, I've heard that some are able to run because they're so used to it. But it's difficult uh, to run uh, with handcuffs on us, is what I've been told. I've never been handcuffed like that, so I can't tell you. Uh, but it, they have been arrested. Uh, it is hard to maneuver. Now, the love of God does that. It constrains us. It holds us. It arrests us. And I believe this with all of my heart. If the world would experience the love of Christ, the things that they are missing, the things that they are, uh, believe that they are, uh, have lost sight of in this life would make perfect sense. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, the love that he has for us is a pure love. He loves us. We sing songs about the love of, uh, of God. The love of God, how rich and pure. How many songs do we sing about the love of God? How many sermons do you hear about the love of God? It's because we have been changed by Him. We celebrate in that. It means something to us. This is love. Not that we loved Him, but that He loved us. He initiates that love relationship with us. So yes, we can be a new creature. And that takes us to a whole new level. But we have a new closeness. Look in verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us by himself, to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now I want to talk to you about some of those big words that you find in there. Reconciliation. This changes the relationship totally. It brings things together. 
But that word impute, that is a banking term, and it literally means to put one into one account, into one's account. Now, uh, it would be if, if I were to take and to put uh, $100 in your bank account, I've imputed to you $100. Now, don't get really excited about that. I'm a pastor. I'm not making a plea to you or a promise. But the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done is he's taken his righteousness and he's put it into our account because we could never be righteous. The Bible says, and it's very clear in Romans, the, there are none righteous, no, not one. And he has put his righteousness into our account so that we could be seen as righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice and his life that was given for us. It has been imputed to us. I think it's a beautiful concept. And never again will he remember our sins. I want to talk specifically, and I had not planned to do this, but I'm going to talk specifically to a group here. There are a group of, of Christians all over the world that cannot get past the guilt in their lives. And I want to talk to you for just a second. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if you deal with guilt in your life, I want you to remember what I'm about to tell you. In Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile, meaning deceit. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. If the great judge of all time has removed our sin and our transgression away from us, then you need to forgive yourself. And some of you are here today strictly because you need to hear this little part of the message. You need to forgive yourself. If the Lord is forgiving you, then you need to forgive yourself and move on. And don't allow Satan to hold you back, to constrain you, or to arrest you by saying, I'm going to stay back where I was. Live in the freedom that Jesus Christ, uh, that God has put you in through the Lord Jesus Christ. Live as free. There is now therefore no condemnation unto those who walk in Christ Jesus. Don't live in condemnation anymore. We don't have to fear it. But live in freedom. The last thing I want to talk to you about. Yes, there's a new closeness uh, found with God. But there's a new calling. Jesus said to them in John 20, 21. Said, peace, I, peace be with you as the Father hath sent me. Even so send I you. The scripture says in verse 20 of our text today. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is both a messenger and a representative of the one who sent him. I am a messenger. I don't just get up uh, and come, come to the office and come up with these sermons just because they make me feel good. I do it because Christ has sent me as an ambassador to you to shepherd you and to love you and to give you the truths out of his word. And the truth of it is you are all ambassadors. I don't ever want to hear it said, that's the preacher's job. I don't ever want to hear that. Because we're one body. We work together. Amen. Don't say that evangelism in this community is something the preacher does. That's something that Belmont does. Don't say that a new identity in this community is something the preacher says. That should be what Belmont says. Don't say that living a new life and repairing uh, lost relationships and, and uh, God using us in a powerful way to lead others to Him. Don't say that's something the preacher does. That's something that Belmont does. And we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we can't do it in and of ourselves. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I love that one. I want to close with this, this thought, but I want to get eye, eye to eye with you as, as good as I can. Julia uh, Harriet Johnston lived 1849 to 1919. Some of you think you maybe have heard that name. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. 
She was the daughter of a minister who lived in Peoria. Johnston was a faithful person to the ministries of the church. She served in Sunday school, as su Sunday school superintendent and teacher for 41 years. By the way, don't say I'm too old to serve because God has a special plan for you. God has a special plan for you. He did for her. She was president for two decades of the Presbyterian uh, Missionary Society, an organization, uh, organization that was founded by her mother. She authored several books, including Indian and Spanish Neighbors and 50 Missionary Heroes. In addition to many Sunday school lessons, she also wrote about 500 hymn texts. Today, her reputation primarily rests upon one hymn. And I would like to uh, I would like to read you some of the words of this particular hymn that I believe is uh, it was added to him, a hymn collection in 1911. So that'll give you some kind of a time frame of what I'm talking about. Apparently, she was moved one day by her understanding of grace and who Jesus Christ is. And she penned this hymn for which she is most famous. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace. Grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace. Grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Today, the grace that has been extended to you is greater than any sin you've ever committed. And I believe this, that if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask him for salvation, he will in no wise cast you out. He will save you today if you ask him to. Do I believe in 2016 that people can still be saved in a Baptist church? I believe it with all my heart. I need you to believe it. I need you to pray for it. I need it to be a part of your daily prayer life that we want to see people saved. We want to see people change with the glorious gospel. That if we want to really make a difference here, that it's going to be through God's grace. Wonderful grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. I'm going to ask our musicians to come down. And if Jesus is so moved in your heart today, Maybe you want to come down and you want somebody to pray with you. I'll be glad to pray with you or get a, a deacon to come down and pray with you. Or maybe you say that today I need to give my life to Christ. I, I, I'm just, I've been thinking about it and today needs to be, be the day of my salvation. We would rejoice with you in that. People hold on to the pew sometimes thinking somebody's going to look at them. We would celebrate with you if you were born again today. Or perhaps you want to join a Bible-believing church where we preach the Lord Jesus Christ and His blood spilt so that we could be redeemed. We'd love to have you. I'm going to ask you if the Lord is so moving in your life, would you come? Father, in Jesus' name, I'm going to ask in this time of invitation, Father, that you're, you would have your will and your way and that people will respond to the call of your Holy Spirit. I pray it now in Jesus' name. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand.